Well, welcome to the Upland Nation podcast. I'm Scott Linden, your host, also the host of Wing Shooting USA, the television show. I hope you'll watch that when you're not listening to the Upland Nation podcast. Great show in store for you today. On the docket, our guest is Craig Doherty. You probably recognize the name from Pointing Dog Journal or maybe uh, just a while back, Field Trial Magazine a well-known guide in New Hampshire, dog trainer, and author of a new book. So stick around to learn everything Craig knows, or at least is willing to spill. We'll also have a tip on public access where you can go to hunt free somewhere in this wonderful country of ours, some hunting strategy and dog handling advice, and a quiz and a prize for somebody out there. So it's all coming up right here on the Upland Nation podcast. Yeah, for many of us, the season is here. For others, it's almost here. And for some of us, we've been scouting all year, and we are getting ready. If you are getting ready to, sageandbreaker.com ought to be your first stop. Sign up for the newsletter, and you'll get in on all the new products when they debut. But also, you can find something, just something I know you can use right now, from a brush and pick tool roll to a shotgun bore cleaning kit and a spray-on clean, lubricate, and protect liquid that I think is the cat's meow. It's all at sageandbreaker.com. And if you haven't yet, hello! If you can't hear that, then you probably are too late, but most of us still can protect our hearing with ESPAmerica.com. The joy of ESP America in-ear digital aids is you can hear the birds, you can hear the dog, you can hear the wind sloughing in the pines, but you won't hear the gunshots. Custom fit, waterproof, it's all at ESPAmerica.com. Dot com. All right, here we are. Craig Doherty, are you on the line with me? I am, Scott, and looking forward to talking with you. Me too, uh, for a whole bunch of reasons, and we'll cover them all, uh, not in one fell swoop. But, you know, congratulations. I know what it's like to write a book. It's never easy, but it's one of those itches that everybody feels like they have to scratch once in a while. Tell me more about building a grouse dog from puppy to polished performer. Well, it, it was, uh, uh, as you know, the publishing world uh, moves in mysterious ways, and, and this was one of those projects where uh, um, Chuck Johnson at uh, Wilderness Adventure Press uh, contacted me, and, and uh, Steve Smith uh, of Pointing Dog Journal had told him I was the guy to, to do a grouse dog training book, and uh, we talked a bit, and uh, I decided that... Uh, it was a project that sort of was a culmination of a 30-year journey on my part with dogs and grouse and field trials and um, seemed like a good project. And uh, I'm pretty happy with the comments we've been getting so far from, about the book. And um, hopefully it'll uh, um, do well. Oh, I'm sure it will. There are so many, you know, it's funny since I've gotten into the bird dog television business, I've, I've realized that there are a lot more gr- avid, dedicated grouse hunters out there than I would have ever thought. Of course, living in the West, that's one reason. But the other reason is I'm working with a lot of those guys, whether, whether it's through RGS or NABDA or anything else. Tell me, what was the biggest challenge putting a book like this together? Well, I really felt like limiting the scope to grouse dogs because um, although that's what I train, um, I really feel like the book addresses, you know, training any dog that you're going to hunt wild birds with. Um, um, The publisher really wanted to focus on the grouse dogs, and and we did, but, uh, um, you know, dog training is dog training is dog training, and, and, um, all those fundamentals that, that we do for grouse dogs, you would do for a quail dog or a, or a sharp-tailed dog or a pheasant dog or um, you know, whatever wild birds you happen to have where, where you are. So, and, and I'm interested to see that the response we've gotten um, has been you know, primarily in the grouse areas, the upper Midwest and Northeast, but we've gotten a lot of 
book sales out west and down south and as words gotten out about the book. So um, I, I think it does have a larger appeal and, and that's sort of coming through uh, as people get exposure to it. I understand why Chuck would want you to put grouse somewhere in the title. Um, it probably does attract uh, those avid participants, but uh, that kind of leads to the question I was thinking about ever since we began our discussion a few weeks ago, and that is grouse versus sharptail versus pheasant versus bobwhite. I mean, are you, I, while most of this is probably relevant to every dog and every game bird, are there some things that you would want us to do if we were dedicated grouse hunters with dedicated grouse dogs? Uh, definitely. And, and, you know, that's part of what the, the plan that the book presents to the readers uh, is about. I mean, um, you know, I start, um, I, I live in northern New Hampshire, as you know, and, and, I have quite literally grouse in my dooryard. Um, I, I've had them walk out on my lawn. I've taken pictures of them from my bedroom window. Um, uh, I've got a hedge of, of wild uh, high bush cranberries on the edge of my lawn, and I have a picture in the book of, I think, five or six grouse <clears throat> in that bush one afternoon. So um, uh, so one of the things that, that you need to do um, is, is give those dogs um, experience on grouse, and if you can't do that, at least get them into into cover and habitat that simulates what you're going to be hunting in. Um, and we talk about that too, you know, planting birds and in appropriate cover and letting letting little puppies get out and and find them um, and get used to to busting the brush and, and that sort of thing. You know? If you're a, a western prairie hunter, um, you really and haven't grouse hunted, you really don't understand quite how thick it can be at times. And so, um, you know, you got to get a dog that's, that's willing to bust the brush, and then you've got to get a dog that, that's willing to at least stay within bell range. And, you know, that can be 150, 200 yards at times with a bigger running dog. But I take my dogs to Kansas now every year. I used to go to Texas. Um, and, you know, they go from – 100 to 200 yard dogs to 400 to 500 yard dogs in a blink of an eye as soon as they get in that open country. But um, to be a grouse dog, you really have to be willing to to adapt to that cover, and a lot of that happens um, in the book with the puppies. Okay, so um, we always say that part of that is genetic, and a dog will adjust to the to the cover based on what his forefathers and foremothers did for generations before him. Are you suggesting we can teach that in some way? Yes, I am. I have dogs here. You know, my dogs are mostly uh, LU dogs, and, and we can talk about that later in the in the conversation if you'd like. Mm -hmm. But I have dogs here that are, are uh, uh, Miller dogs, you know, sort of all-age pointer breeding and and some bigger running pointing dog breedings. And the ones I've been able to start as puppies, um, I've been able to, to ingrain in them uh, through training a, a more quartering type pattern and, and a little closer range than they might have initially um, uh, wanted to, to do on their, you know, with their genetic imprinting. Um, and so, uh, yeah, I think you can you can change that. Um, it's it's more work, obviously, um, with a dog that's that's less willing to, to run that way. But um, you know, if training if you're training for something particular, and you have a, a clear concept of what that is, which is sort of another premise of the book is is you know, if you're going to build something, you have a set of plans that you follow, and, and when you start out, you, you you know what you're going to build and what it's going to look like when you're done. Um, and if you're building a grouse dog, you, you should have a good idea of what that finished grouse dog is going to need to do and what steps you're going to take along the way to, to turn it into that. Um, I, I also believe it's a lot easier for for our dogs to go out west and hunt and adapt quickly to, to the wide open spaces 
than it is to take a dog that grew up in Oregon or Montana running the prairies and bring him back here to the woods and, and expect him to understand uh, intuitively that he's got to be close and, and, and uh, fought handier back here. Well, thank you. From an expert, that's my story, and I'm sticking to it. I don't care what you say about my dogs. <laughs> Craig Doherty I, is yeah, our I, <laughs> Craig Doherty's our guest. Uh, his new book is called "Building a Grouse Dog from Puppy to Polished Performer." Craig, you also write for Pointing Dog Journal, and and before that, a lot of us remember you as the publisher and editor of Field Trial Magazine. Um. You know, out of that experience in particular, um, is there anything that you would draw that that would be of of value and relevance to most of us guys who aren't field trialers but love to watch dogs and love to hunt birds? What would that what What would you suggest we we've learned or you've learned that we should learn? Well, one of the things, one of the most valuable things I learned was. Uh, you know, I used to visit a lot of trainers and interview them and, and you know, do profiles on them. I spent a lot of time with George Tracy, and and uh, uh, I go through it, a, wrote a column for George um, in the early years of, of Field Trial Magazine. And uh, I think the one thing that we could learn is that we could all have better dogs if we paid attention to how these professional trainers, handlers, go about preparing the dogs for what they need them to do. <clears throat> you know, their level of, of performance is, um, is much higher level than most of us expect from our hunting dogs. And, and I think most of our hunting dogs, um, although they might not be competitive with those dogs, in, you know, when you, if you jumped up on a horse and, and turned them loose, but they can perform... Uh, on birds and handling and uh, and polish and finish um, to that same level um, if you pay attention to how these guys go about doing things. Amen to that. You know, I, my only career that I'm qualified to uh, to work in is the music business, and, and I don't care what level you were at, if you could go and watch an incredible musician perform, or even better, take a lesson from that person. I don't care if you were still trying to figure out how to put your clarinet together. You're going to pick up something that's going to be of value to you. You know, the funny thing is, though, and I was just at a NABDA training event over the weekend, helping a bunch of guys out. And what I realized is nobody really pays attention and looks at that stuff analytically. You really have to kind of focus. It's almost like you might expect a pop quiz at the end of the day. And if you're not ready for it, and you really have, you probably shouldn't have gone. I mean, is that what you're talking about, Craig? Well, yeah, you definitely need to do your homework to use that educational uh, metaphor that you brought up. And you, and you have to, to, to study in between times. And, and when it comes time to, to take the test, you got to read the questions carefully um, to come up with the right answer. And, and if the test is your dog, um, you know, you really need to learn your learn to read your dog too. The dog, um, you know, this is one thing I learned from George Tracy is the the dog's the one that tells you what you can and can't do with it, or how fast you can do it, or how slow it's going to be, or how much pressure it can take. And if you pay attention to those cues from the dog, um, you're going to be able to pass that test a lot more um, readily. Yeah, you're exactly right. It's the first chapter in my book. <laughs> uh, yeah, but, but but we are mo mainly guilty of not doing enough of that, and that is for sure. I mean, it's it could be real subtle. It could be the way a head turns or the blink of an eye or the tail set or something else. And, and if we're not watching and we don't know what our dogs are really doing, then poof, we're starting from square one every morning. You know, yeah, let's and, go ahead. And just to give you a, a, an example from today's, training session it was real hot here today so rather than than you know i got out early in the woods with the older dogs and then i i ran i don't know 15 18 dogs just through a backing drill with a backing dummy and um there were a couple of dogs that the the young man that works with me didn't notice but i noticed who really wanted to blink those backs and you know they pretended they didn't see the the dummy they you know they tried to 
they saw it out of the corner of their eye and tried to go in the opposite direction and things like that. And it would have been very easy to let them get away with it. Um, not that they needed a real strong connection correction, but you know, to force them to come back and, and do what was, was supposed to happen. And, and it was only through careful observation of, of the cues they were giving me that, you know, I knew what was going on. Saw it twice last Saturday. I can't believe I figured it out, but I did knock wood. Luckily it wasn't my dog, but that's another story. He's got more problems than, than I can uh, shake a stick at. Hey, uh, before the, the first segment here ends, uh, Craig Doherty, you're also a, a, a guide in New Hampshire. Um, let's talk a little bit about uh, grouse hunting per se, and some of the things that uh, you see on almost a daily basis during the season that that can help us or, or that we ought to avoid for that matter. I mean, if you were, if we were having this discussion, just you and me one-on-one, -on -one, and I was going to book you for a, a couple of days of guided hunting in New Hampshire, what are the things you would want me to do with my shooting and my dog before I showed up in your doorstep? Well, the first thing I tell you is to get a really good pair of boots, but uh, um, we hunt some pretty rugged country. Um, but if you're bringing bringing your dog, the most important thing is is, is your dog's in condition. Um, you know, I, I I work some gun dogs. A lot of the dogs I work are, are cover dogs, field trial dogs. But um, these people bring me dogs that that often have gained, you know, five, six, or more pounds in the off season, maybe even ten pounds. And if you take a 40 pound dog and you gain 10 pounds, that's an, an immense a lot of weight. Uh, you know, that's 25% of its body weight. And to, to take that off and on again and again is, 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 is hard on the dog and, and hard on you. So, you know, my first thing would be um, figure out some program to get your dog in shape before you get here. Um, don't show up with a dog that's going to last 10 minutes because you're going to get frustrated. The dog's going to make mistakes. And, um, you know, I've got plenty of dogs, but if you're coming to, to give your dog's experience, it's probably not going to be a very good one if they can't, you know, get out and, and run in the woods for, for a good hour and a half or, or so. Um, uh, most of our covers are, are an hour to an hour and a half long. So uh, nice. that would be one thing. Um, well, how about on the, on the skill side for that dog? If there's, if, I mean, if there was, if you had to boil it down to one thing that you would want any grouse dog to do, if they were coming along with you, is it about steadiness? Is it about, um, range? Is it about, um, handling birds? You tell me what, what is the, the critical factor? The most critical thing is staunch. Mm -hmm. Because, well, uh, woodcock are easy. They, most of the time sit right in front of the dog. Uh, so you don't need to be staunch for that. But grouse are gallinaceous birds. They feed on the ground. They rather walk than fly. And um, if you have a dog that's not going to stand there while you come to it, uh, you know, and, and it might take you a few minutes to, to go 100 yards in the woods, uh, especially if it's sick and find the dog. <coughs> so... It's much more a question of, of, of staunchness. Can you trust that dog to, to run at a, a at its range, whatever its range is, and stand there till you get there and still have the, the bird in front of it? And, you know, if, if you've got a dog that, that uh, uh, take, catches scent and uh, tries to sneak in on the bird or go around the bird, you know, I, I, I often hear about pheasant dogs that'll circle a bird and pin it so it can't run out the other side. And, you know, that's well and good out in the, in, the, in a cornfield, but here in the woods, it, it, I really don't see that kind of strategy working with a dog. So you want a dog that's going to, going to hit live scent and stop, not foot scent because, you know, a lot of grouse could have walked through here in the last 24 hours and we don't want a dog that, that's stopping every time he catches cold foot scent. We want hot body scent and you know and that's that's something that the first time you come we, we might have a problem with that your dog um, 
doesn't get close enough to the bird, stops on the foot scent. Um, and I think that's a mistake a lot of amateur trainers, um, guys that have only had a dog or two or, or haven't been doing this for a long time, make is they want that dog to, to stop no matter what because they'd rather have a non-productive than have the dog bust the bird. I'm just the opposite. I the, the I loathe a non-productive where the dog's standing and I go and there's no bird, and I'd rather the dog make a mistake once in a while than be so cautious that he has four false points for every one bird he actually points. I only have so much adrenaline in my body at any point, so I, I agree a hundred percent. Hey, you know, um, we're, we're up against a break here. Let me remind everybody, if you want Craig Doherty's new book, Building a Grouse Dog from Puppy to Polished Performer, am I right to suggest going to wildapplekennel.com to order that, Craig? You you are correct. And it, there's a banner across the top, and, and one of the links on that banner is Building a Grouse Dog, and just click on it, and there's a, a, a fully functional e-commerce link right there all right no blueprints in the book but uh, by the time you're done with it your dog will be better i don't care if it's sharp-tailed grouse or rough grouse maybe even a blue grouse or two or whatever they're calling that other one now sooty grouse anyway yeah i, I i've never seen one so i i uh, i'd love to though well i'm hoping to do a little bit of that this year I, i'm told though the problem is you start hunting at six thousand feet I used to live at 6,000 feet. That's not necessarily in New Mexico. <laughs> it, it was going from 6 to 8 that was always the problem. So I'm told. <laughs> All right, hang on, Craig, through the break here. We've got a, a quick commercial announcement, and then I've got uh, something that's related to some of the things we've already talked about. So just to bear with me for a moment as we pay the bills around here. All right, Scott. Hey, you got yourself a nice new rig. How about your dog? Dakota283.com is where you can find them, a crate or a kennel for just about any kind of dog. And one of the saving graces is you can actually see through the door. Dakota283.com is where you get all the information. Now, make a note, if you're getting a G3 kennel from Dakota283.com, you are also eligible for a free accessory, either the Dine and Dash, and the code for that is Linden. D D or the expandable interior wall. We call it the forever insert. And it is the code is Linden F I it's all at Dakota 283.com get involved. And, uh, the prices have dropped a little bit. So, uh, you might want to think about one for that other dog as well. Also dogtra dot com find out all you can about their new tnb dual collar one transmitter two sets of buttons in parallel so you can run two dogs two collars without having to flip back and forth toggle hit another thing here and there get lost in the screen whatever it is it ain't going to happen with a dogtra new tnb dual collar if you'd like more information on that one or anything else they have, and take a chance at uh, maybe some free shipping if you spend over 200 bucks. It's all at dogtra.com. Okay, we are back with Craig Doherty, author, former publisher, writer, dog trainer, guide. This guy does it all. When do you find time to eat dinner, Craig? Uh, well... <laughs> Days are long this time of year, so <laughs> yes, they are, and they start early, don't they? Oh my! Yeah, we have to we have to get out right around sunrise to to get what we can of the cool of the day. Although last week we had some days in the 40s in the mornings, which were just good as it gets this time of year oh man we we live for those i know i know what you mean hey this is our handle it uh segment where we talk about dog training and all of that sort of thing and, and we didn't get around to it but this this came up and actually this is interesting because it was it's going to be a, a topic anyway and then here somebody posted on facebook this whole idea of the wing on a string and how, um, boy, my dog will point those wings all day long. But uh, when we get out into the woods or into the prairie, the dog doesn't quite get it yet. 
I've always called that a kind of a parlor trick. It doesn't really show us that a dog is, uh, you know, instinctively going to point uh, everything. Uh, but and, and we don't want to talk about the wing on the string per se, but, but we want to talk about what I saw a lot last Saturday at our training day, and that was dogs that would not point a dog that they first winded and then saw because the planter had put them in plain sight and those birds were so dizzy that they wouldn't fly when they saw the saw the dog. So, Craig, is there anything we can do in the way of training dogs to deal with birds that they see first or they see as they're winding a bird? I think we can we can adjust our training as much as possible to avoid that. Mm-hmm. I think that the, you know, um, I'm glad we're not going to talk about the wing on a string, but um, sight pointing is not something that is really all that valuable to us. Um, even if you're in the wide open, most short grass prairie you've ever been on, a, a bobwhite quail disappears and, and you don't see it and the dog doesn't see it or rarely sees it. It's the problem, it seems to me, that you're describing is the dogs not stopping on the bird scent. Mm-hmm. And, mm-hmm. Um, it's always hard in a training environment because the, there's always human scent, there's human foot scent, the, the bird planters walked around. I've had dogs that I, I, I literally couldn't work them on planted birds if I wanted them to run because they would just go out in the field, find my footprints, and track me to the to the planting site, and then point. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, dogs are, are that smart. Um, so, if you're going to use planted birds, um, you have to be you have to put some some responsibility on the bird planter to do a good job of it. Um, you know, the birds need to be in enough cover that the, they're not going to be read, readily visible, and they can't be so dizzy that they're they're not going to react. Um, you know, there's, there's, I do a lot of work with pigeons um, because I use remote release traps, and the beauty of that is the dog learns that if they take that extra step, the bird's gone. Um, because I can make it go. Um, and so I try to correct that problem you're describing uh, before we get to it. So that the few times that that we might be in a training situation with a group or in a test or in a field trial where we're going to see the bird, um, it, the dog is not immediately going to react to Oh, there it is. I'm going to go grab it, or I'm going to go creep in on it. Mm-hmm. Um, I also do some desensitizing. Um, I'll put dogs up on the woe bench and put a pigeon in a little wire cage and have it right in front of their nose, and I'll have them um, uh, checked up with the overhead um, tie on the on the bench, and I'll fly that bird two feet in front of them after they've watched it, um, and I'm trying. What I'm doing there is I'm trying to desensitize them to wanting to grab that bird when they see it, uh, knowing that, you know, uh, or at least getting them thinking that that they can't do that. Um, so it's it's a situation where you know one to to go back over it. I, I would talk to the bird planner and say, hey. You can't you can't dizzy these birds to the point where they're not going to get up. Two, you got to make sure you put them in some cover so they're not sticking out like a sore thumb when the bird when the dog comes across them. And then three, as a dog trainer handler, um, you know I want my dogs um, thinking that if they get too close to that bird, that bird's leaving. And and you can do that in training and then um, get by with it occasionally in, in a trial or a, or a um, testing situation. Um, and especially if you do some, some desensitizing. And, you know, I, I knew someone who was very adept at, at planted quail trial 
quails, and he would have quail, you know, war with dog, and have quail walk around his feet and under it and put them on his head and all this sort of stuff. He didn't have the most stylish dog in the world because the dog didn't really like it all happening, <laughs> but the dog would stand for it all. Um, so there's lots of there's a number of strategies you can you can do to to deal with a situation like that. Great, and uh, and by the way, that's what we're working on these days. So let's talk a little bit about more a little bit more about th- this whole world that you're involved in that I'm deeply involved into birds, bird dogs, and bird hunting. You know, what is it about all of this that that kind of gets the adrenaline flowing in Craig Doherty? That's an easy one. I mean, uh, I was out today with uh, four dogs. They were, they were four, five, and eight. Two of them were four. You know, they're, they're experienced shooting dogs, and... Um, my dog, Wild Apple, spot on, uh, a pointer male that is a champion. I cut him loose in my Garmin because I, I, I depend on my electronics. Uh, as I heard the bell stop, and I looked down, and he was 225 yards away. And I went up this skitter road, 220 yards. And I saw him five yards away, standing in an opening, looked like a million bucks. And I took one more step, and five grouse, a brood of five grouse blew out. And there may have been more there that had walked away while I was walking to the dog. But, I mean, it's just, it's, you know, after thousands and thousands and thousands, literally, of times seeing that happen, I still get excited and, 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 uh, um, for the dog and for myself when I, when I see that happen. And this, this time of year, all I can do is shoot blanks. So, um, I mean, I'm out there swatting deer flies and soaked from the dew and I'm, I'm still enjoying it. Yeah. The hair is standing up on my arms after that. It's a, absolutely right. And of course, everybody has their own reasons, but, uh, that's how I fell into this whole world was watching dog hit a point for the first time. So I got a, I got a, uh, uh kind of a, uh, insider question for you. You know, the, 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 the guy piles into the cab in New York and he's got a violin case and, and, uh, he says to the cab driver, Hey, how do you get to Carnegie hall? And the cab driver says, practice. You got to Carnegie hall back in 2007 with that grand national champion. I think it's the same dog you were just talking about. Um, Close to it, maybe. No, you, you know, Wild Apple Jack was, was your champion. Wild Apple Jack. Yeah. Yes. All right. You know, uh, those of us who aspire to have a, a, a Grand National Champion or win their Nastra event or just have a dog that they can brag about at the end of a chucker hunt, um, you know, what are the things that are involved? I, can, I don't want you to tell us everything. We don't have all day. But, you know, what are the main things that we should be focusing on, uh, both personally and for our dog, that are going to help us get that dog to be a better bird hunter and, 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 and for us help us to help him? The, the hardest thing for me and for many people that I see training dogs is, to not do too much. These dogs that we're breeding nowadays, and, and, and I think this is true across all breeds to a certain extent, especially with, with the dogs I deal with, are so naturally gifted that, and, and athletically inclined and precocious in their bird work that, uh, um, if you have the ability to recognize that and guide the dog to, to its potential rather than imposing some set of, of preconceived ideas about what the dog should and shouldn't do, um, that's how you get those, those superlative uh, performers like, like a Jack or, or like the spot dog I was talking about. Um, mm-hmm. You know, and, and I'm very fortunate that um, I own a few of them, and, and I've got a bunch of them here that customers own that that are just 
so naturally talented. You know, they, they make me look good, uh, but at the same time, I really, I really have to fight the inclination to say, oh, well, this dog should be doing this right now instead of what it thinks it should do, when when I really step back and look at it, the dog is going to the right places, going the right distances, is finding the birds that I wouldn't have led it to if I was steering. Um, yeah. You know, and I see guys go to a field trial and they're trying to steer their dog around the course rather you know, to get them to this bird spot and that bird spot. And really you got to let, be willing to trust your dog and, and let it um, do what it's been bred to do um, without a lot of your thumbprints on it. Not to say you don't train the dog, because you do, but at the same time you have to think of yourself as someone who's taking all that potential and, and polishing it, not, you know, um, over regimenting it or, or, or forcing it to do things in some preconceived way that, that may or may not be, uh, what that dog's actual nature is. I get it. Uh, I used to say, um, follow the hunter with the longest nose. Once you open the tailgate, um, the experts, the guy with four legs, not two. Right. Uh, you're listening. I mean, to... they, they, they have to go with you and they have to, you know, they have to hunt for the gun and when, when we're hunting. Uh, but at the same time, um, if, if you're in a crummy part of the, the cover and, and they go to the front and get to the good part of the cover and find the bird, uh, what mistake did they make? Precisely. You know, well, yeah. Why should you be leaning on that e-collar button to get them back, you know, within 50 yards or whatever? Um, it, it's, it's, um, you know, a lot of times it's, it's a lack of confidence in the hand the handler has in the dog, and um, you know, and that brings you back to that staunchness point I made earlier, where you, if your dog is staunch and will stand there while you get to it, then you really don't have to worry about letting it run a little further or, or run a little bigger. So. Yeah, I get that question a lot, and I tell them virtually the same thing. You know, uh, you, you can't really change your dog's range all that much, but you can change your dog's steadiness. Yep. Um, you're listening to the Upland Nation podcast. I'm your host, Scott Linden. That's Craig Doherty, author, editor, dog trainer, pro guide in New Hampshire. Let's talk uh, quickly about uh, that. Um, you guide folks all the time, you know, is there anything in, in terms of a guide moment that might be of value to us? Should we work with a pro guide next season with something we should do? We shouldn't do, uh, we should shut up. We should open our mouths. Uh, you're the pro tell us what to do or not to do Craig. The most important thing, you know, is, is, um, you, you're paying somebody for their expertise um, take advantage of it. And, and by that, I mean, um, I'll give you an example. I had a, a, a rather wealthy young guy come up and, and, uh, you know, he'd been to Argentina and shot, you know, a thousand doves a day and, you know, a real great shot and all this sort of stuff. And, um, he showed up with this beautiful $65,000 Billy Rosini 28 gauge side by side that weighed under five pounds. And he was shooting RST number 10. And, and this was, which they call their woodcock load. And uh, I told him, you know, number 10 was like throwing rock salt. Um, you know, it just wasn't going to, it was early in the season. It wasn't going to punch through any leaves. Um, it just wasn't enough for woodcock and especially not enough for grouse. And, um, he sort of nodded and kept stuffing number 10s in his, his gun. And uh, I kept trying to get him into the right position to, to shoot because, you know, I want, I, as a guide, I want people to be successful. And so I try to steer him to the right little opening where, where I had an experience to know that considering the way my dog was standing and, and, the, and the cover, would be the most likely spot for him to get a, a, a decent look at a bird blowing out. Cause it's always, 
especially early in the season here, it's always a, a relatively quick shot. And he just wouldn't listen. He came back again the next year. He had the same number 10 shot um, you know, in the same four-pound gun and and was just totally frustrated. Um, and so if you're going to spend, you know, I, I get a substantial amount of money. If you're going to spend that kind of money to, to use me and my dog, um, be smart enough to, to take my advice and, and take advantage of my expertise to give yourself the best opportunities. Yeah. <laughs> what a concept. <laughs> um, speaking of somebody who wants to learn more, uh, one of our listeners, Carl Rains, has a question for you, Craig. Um, and feel free to extemporaneously uh, uh, editorialize on this topic as well. He says, how do I get the tail straight and make it look as good as your dogs, Craig? Genetics. Yeah. It's, it's, it's a hundred percent genetics. Um, I have some dogs right now that are the culmination of Bob Whaley's, I don't know, 70, 80 years of breeding dogs and, and the, and the um, ongoing work with that line of dogs since in the 17 years since Bob passed away. And, um, you know, we just didn't, uh, the, the responsible, uh, conscientious breeders don't breed dogs with bad tails. And if you don't breed dogs with bad tails, you're going to get a much higher percentage of good tails. You know, and if you breed short hairs and you breed the, the whitest one to the whitest one, you're going to keep getting whiter and whiter short hairs. If you breed solid brown ones to solid brown ones, you know, whatever trait you want or don't want, you 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 work in your breeding program to get um and you know if 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 for some reason you know um you're retrieving is retrieving is a is a paramount importance to you and and you pick a breed that doesn't do a lot of retrieving i mean you're you're setting yourself up for disappointment and aggravation I, I hate to sound yeah. like Homer Simpson, but duh. <laughs> <laughs> Some people would yeah. accuse me of all of that, uh, thinking like Homer Simpson for that matter. Um, Craig, um, it is different, and you talk about it in your book, I'm sure. Um, you know, those of us who do two or three grouse hunts a year or two or three grouse hunts in our lifetime are intimidated by all those tree trunks. Um, and you just talked about shooting with number 10 shot. We used to call that dust shot back in the days, I think, in, in England. That's what they called it. Um, but um, it is one of those things that um, you you probably see every time you take customers out there. They haven't practiced shooting in that kind of a, an environment. Is there anything we can do at the skeet range or anywhere else to, to get better at shooting with all that stuff in the way? Jeez, I, um, that's a good question, Scott. Let me, let me give you, it's not a question of being a good shot or a bad shot. Anticipation is, is really the key. Um, you're only going to get a brief look at a grouse or a woodcock in most of the cover and most of the, the range of those birds. And so you, you can't be anticipating um, that you're going to get, you know, a long look at the bird to carefully aim and swing and pick your point. You really almost, it's not quite snap shooting, but it's, it's very close to it. Um, you know, you can still swing with the birds. You can still um, go up with the rising woodcock, but, it's it's really the being and having that moment of anticipation where where you um, are looking in the right direction. You got your gun in the ready position, and when the bird goes, uh, you know as soon as that gun hits your shoulder and you can see the bird, you pull the trigger. Um, it, it, and that's what what is the problem for most of the guys I hunt with is they don't 
get on the bird quick enough. Um, and part of it is a lot of my clients are older. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I'm always listening for the bird, um, you know, for the, the thunder of the grouse wings or the whistle of the woodcock wings, as well as looking into a, into a space where I think the bird is going to be. Thank um, you. You get a you get a gold star for saying what you just said. Which is what? Look where the bird is going, not where the bird is starting. Right. Well, that, that looking down, I, you know, and, and I catch myself because I love to see the woodcock on the ground, and you know, I'll, I'll tell my guys as I, I see the bird. It's like ten feet in front of the dog, right by the base of that tree. But don't look down. I always do. So, <laughs> Um, you know, it's, it's hard. You got to keep your head up. That's, that's Um, like telling somebody, don't think about Hawaii. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) Definitely. Oh, that's so good. And, and I appreciate your bringing it up too. Um, you know, I, you, before I made the TV show I make now, Wing Shooting USA, I, I made a whole bunch of others, including one about sporting clays. And I never thought about that. We could have put, we could have gone to the skeet range, which of course, as we both know, was developed to help grouse hunters become better grouse mm-hmm. hunters. We should put a whole bunch of telephone poles on the range there. I've been to, to sporting clays where they put, put them all in the woods. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and the problem is that in very short order, uh, everybody's blown all the foliage away and it, it's wide open again. Yeah. Um, we, we see that a lot. <laughs> so so it, it, it's really hard. And, you know, the, the one time I shot sporting clays, the one shot I was really good at was the springing teal. Cause that was the thing that was closest to a, to a rising woodcock. And I just, I just dusted those, everything else I missed. Well, that's because it got up above the trees too. <laughs> well, we're getting towards, towards the bitter end here. Craig Doherty, the author of the new book, Building a Grouse Dog from Puppy to Polished Performer, also a, a New Hampshire guide, et cetera, et cetera, dog training. In fact, uh, I think you're doing some seminars uh, also these days, aren't you? So if they want to keep in touch with all of that, anybody, anything you want to know about Craig and his activities, Wild Apple Kennel dot com they'll never be sour they're always ripe and ready for you at wildapplekennel.com craig if you wanted to leave us with one more bit of uh, i don't know you could wax poetic or you could give give us a little bit of your philosophy about bird hunting and bird dogs what would you leave us with don't take yourself too seriously have fun uh, i mean i think that that you know we're such competitive people that that we forget that these activities are recreation um, and, you know, um, having the right gun and having the right clothes and having the right boots and, you know, we get competitive about all that stuff and my dog's better than your dog. Well, go to a field trial if you want to compete. If you want to have have fun and enjoy, enjoy upland shooting, then go bird hunting. It, it is, it should be fun. Words to live by. You'll probably live a lot longer as a result. Craig Doherty, it's it's a pleasure to finally get to know you a little bit. Uh, appreciate your spending some time with us here at the Upland Nation podcast. Good luck with the book. Good luck with everything else you're doing. Have a great season out there, and thanks for joining us. Thank you, Scott. It's been a pleasure. A great guy with some great advice. I hope you made notes. And speaking of making notes, here's a couple more for you. Thank you again to our new sponsor, ESPAmerica.com. You know, I do drill on this a lot because it is so important, but your hearing loss is cumulative. So if you're not wearing hearing protection in the field as well as on the range, it's going to add up, literally. At ESPAmerica.com, custom-fitted, waterproof, fit exactly to your individual ear, Hearing protection starts at 900 bucks and goes up from there. But how much is your hearing worth? Find out more about how it works and how to order, including that local custom fitting at ESPAmerica.com. And finally, our newest sponsor is Dogtra.com, the new T&B Dual one-hand controller 
two collars on two dogs or one on the front and one around the flank, which is what I'm doing right now. It's all at dogtra.com, the TNB Duel. No toggling back and forth, looking for the right buttons or anything else because it's got two sets. It's all at dogtra.com. Free shipping on any purchase over 200 bucks. And that is the cue for me to talk about this land is your land. That's right. Public access. I know it's a priority for you. It is for me. I hunt a lot of public ground and ground that's open to the public, even though it's privately owned. Got a great place for you. Thanks to my good friend, Cletus Bianchi at Lay Laps. Cletus, of course, uh, trying to shoot birds over all of in all 49 states uh, over his bird dog. He suggests someplace in Louisiana for Woodcock, of all things. Yeah, Sherburn National Wildlife Area in Louisiana. If you didn't know it, you do now. That's where a lot of the woodcock in our country and in Canada go in the wintertime. It won't be the Great North Woods or other classic de- destinations, but, you know, there's some great le- late-season upland hunting, and the weather is really nice in January and December. Rather be shoveling snow or eating black and redfish in New Orleans. Well... There's your choice. Sherburn has some pretty good habitat with a lot of the kind of moist soil and thick multi-generational cover that comes out of the Woodcock textbook. If you'd like more information, check out the Wildlife and Fisheries Office in Opelousas, Louisiana. And good luck. Laissez bon temps rouler, as they say down there. All right, this last segment of the show is brought to you by, hey, a new project of ours, me and Pheasant Bonanza, the hunting lodge in Takema, Nebraska, are teaming up to do what we're calling the Upland Nation University. Two days with me and with the guys from Pheasant Bonanza, where we are uh, giving you little chalk talks and uh, mini lectures. No, nothing academic. Don't worry about that. And then we're going out in the field together. You're going to learn all the things that uh, we've all learned from other people. And uh, you will be picking up as you uh, walk through the fields working with your dogs or with Pheasant Bonanza dogs. It's all about fellowship, fun, and learning a bit here and there If you'd like more information, go to pheasantbonanza.com and book that trip. We'll see you in March at Pheasant Bonanza in Nebraska for the Upland Nation University. And finally, this week's trivia quiz. Some great answers to this at Facebook, but I really want you to send those answers to scottlindenoutdoors at gmail.com because that way, if you have the winning correct answer, you're not sharing it with everybody else. I ask them on Facebook, but you answer them at scottlindenoutdoors at gmail.com. The question way back when, two spaniels that came from the same litter could ultimately be called different names. And I don't mean God damn it or no, no, no bad dog. They could be called different types of dogs based on their size. Do you know what one of those or both of those are? If you did, then you were eligible for the drawing for that Peregrine Field Gear Trekker Dog Handler's Dog Vest. Well, it's a vest for humans, but it's a dog handler's vest, version 2.0 with some of my suggestions on it. I think you'll enjoy it. If you want to learn more, go to peregrinefieldgear.com. The correct answer came from Jeff Hall. He says Cockers and Springers. Absolutely right. The little ones, Cocker Spaniels, of course, perfect for hunting Woodcock. Springer Spaniels, a little bit bigger. They would spring the dog, the birds, spring the birds into the air. We call them flushing now. And and they had a, you know, uh, uh, I guess a separation back in the 1800s sometime. And that was the end of that. Now we have two different kinds of Spaniels, Springers, and Cockers. All right. We're at the end of the show. I'm sure appreciative of your spending some time with me and with Craig Doherty, and I hope you learned something. If you did, tell your friends. If you didn't, send me an email or post it on Facebook. Upland Nation is where you find us. 
And if you have a question of any kind or a suggestion, or if you want to be on the podcast, then let's correspond at the Facebook page, Upland Nation. Or subscribe to the podcast at UplandNation.com, Spotify, Google Podcast, all those other folks. They've all got it, and I hope you will get it too. Thank you again for listening. Be safe and have a great season.